Welcome to everyone and thank you for joining our conference. Um, I am excited that this is the second of our plenary sessions of our two-day conference, Academic Mentorship, Fostering Equity, Diversity and Inclusiveness. I'm Jonathan Sherbino. I am the Assistant Dean for Merit. This conference is possible through the generous assistance of the PSI Foundation that's offered us an unrestricted educational grant. It's brought to you by Merit, the Department of Medicine and Faculty Affairs. Before we begin, um, I think it's a very appropriate that we acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territories of the Mississauga and the Haudenosaunee, nations that are protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. Let's take a moment here to reflect on how we can think about this conference in light of the reality of where we're situated. For me, as I reflect, I think of the idea of mentoring for diversity certainly is inclusive or should be considered within the concept of community. And as First Nations, the importance of community and connectedness. It's my great um, pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Lisa Richardson. Dr. Richardson is a clinician educator and an internist at the University of Toronto, where she practices at the UHN. She is also an education scientist and researcher at the Wilson Center and holds the role of strategic advisor in Indigenous Health at the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine and is the Indigenous Strategy Lead for Women's College Hospital. In addition to these numerous roles, she is an Associate Professor and Vice Chair of Culture and Inclusion in the Department of Medicine, chairs a number of provincial and national committees to advance Indigenous medical education, and has been recognized for her significant contributions to medicine and the profession with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, Surgeons Thomas Dignan Award for Indigenous Health. It's our great pleasure to have her here speaking to us today about mentoring for diversity. Thank you very much, Dr. Richardson. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Sherbino, and thank you to everyone who's here. I know that um, you know we're gathering over uh, a time that's often important for families and uh, loved ones. So appreciate that you're that you're joining me here. Um, I wanted to acknowledge that I'm actually in Toronto, so I'm on a different uh, traditional territory, slightly different traditional territory, still um, still home to the Mississauga of the Credit and, and the Haudenosaunee, but we also ancestrally um, have other Anishinaabeg people here, Chippewa, um, Wendat, um, and many Métis people and others from across Turtle Island, including Inuit, who are now residing in Toronto, or as we call it, Tacoronto. So um, really grateful to be here. Um, and I've actually decided to speak um, without slides. And I think I, <laughs> I worried Jonathan a little bit when I said this, but um, I've decided to do this because uh, I wanted to, to think about how we do things in a different way and how we create space for actually different ways of um, being in this world, different ways of creating academic work and acknowledge that we all have different perspectives and, and backgrounds that may require that. And so I wanted to acknowledge this, the oral tradition and um, as Anishinaabe people, the, the power of oratory is extremely important. And we are often taught storytelling and taught to share our ideas through the oral um, tradition. But it, it is something recently that um, one of the elders said to me is a dying art. And so I think it's important to recognize this as, as a way of conveying information. And, and that's one of the reasons in which I, for which I, I, I'm not using slides today. I, I do know how to make PowerPoint. I do have some, some beautiful photos that I often share, but this is going to be a little bit of a personal journey for me um, in speaking about men mentorship. Um, and, you know, when I was first asked to do the talk, um, I said to Jonathan, of course, yeah, no problem, happy to do it. It's such an important topic. But and, and I do many, many talks and thought this would be simple, but I realized I was really struggling with it. And um, I realized that my struggle actually emerged from some of my own experiences as a medical learner and that I needed to kind of work through that in order to be able to to do this presentation and to speak 
um, openly and transparently about where um, change needs to happen and the kind of amazing changes that are already happening to be creating supportive and inclusive places. So my background is a personal introduction. I am, um, I am, as per my bio, an internist. Um, I'm a, a mixed blood person. So my background on my mother's side is Anishinaabe. Our traditional territory is north of here along the coast of Georgian Bay in a community called Shabahanonang or uh, Killarney. And our ties are also with with Wemakong, but that's a complicated story related to um, traditional territory and who signed what treaties and enfranchisement, etc. Um, so a lot of the work that I do now as an educator is around working with the privilege that I have as a physician and um, having had a privileged upbringing to kind of create change within our institutions of healthcare, both educational institutions and hospitals and clinic environments to, to make them more inclusive. Um, and really one of my passions all along has been how can we make our educational institutions safe spaces for not just indigenous learners, but um, black learners, queer learners, disabled learners, others who come from groups that are structurally marginalized. Um, and, and I don't mean that to be an exhaustive list, but to really think about how, when we create places of inclusion, everyone will thrive. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about here today. So my experience as a resident um, who came to Toronto was one of, when, when I think about it and the reason I become emotional and thinking about, I'm not going to share any of the personal details because I don't think that's relevant. And I know this is going to be on YouTube at one point, but it was one of, um, of feeling isolated, um, and a feeling that I didn't belong and a feeling overwhelmed resp with responsibilities. I had a lot of stress at home. Um, I had both of my children as a resident. I had, there was a lot going on in my family of origin at the time and I was, um, you know, I was having to offer support emotionally and otherwise there. And I had a feeling during my training that there was nobody with whom I could share what was going on. And furthermore, I had what I call this um, need to perform the um, or embody or enact the idea of the good doctor and the good resident, which it was, uh, you know, the performativity in this was because I didn't feel that with everything going on outside of my life and then with not necessarily um, that all of that other part of me not being recognized that I didn't necessarily um, fit in and that I had to hide a part of myself. And the outcomes of that, although I worked very hard and performed well as a, as a resident, when I look back at my eiders, that was not the issue. It was that feeling of not being able to bring my whole self into my work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the outcome of that was that I routinely thought about leaving the program, the internal medicine training program. Um, I thought about whether I should switch into another specialty. I thought about whether I should, um, you know, go and do a PhD in social sciences because the MD training would um, help me. But, but really, uh, it was, it was a, t a difficult time. And, and really, despite the incredible people here at the University of Toronto where I had done my training, there was just a sense that there wasn't anyone who I necessarily could connect with and share honestly what was going on for me. I remember at one point meeting a hematologist who told me about how she had done two months on and two months off during her training because she'd had um, her children as a resident as well. And I thought, oh, bingo, okay, there's something that I can do. So I had some encounters. There were encounters that I had with some people that were really important and, and meaningful. Um, but there wasn't, you know, that person or numerous people to whom I could turn to say, yeah, I'm not really sure having a bad day here, you know, lots going on at home. Um, these are the stresses. I feel like I may need to take a little time off, et cetera. There just wasn't any of that. Ultimately, um, I stretched my residency out because I realized that that model of um, taking a little bit of time to be with my children was an excellent one. Um, I supported my family of origin. I supported my own new family through numerous traumatic events. 
I rotated through all of the subspecialty rotations. I applied to the general internal medicine program. I uh, successfully got in. And I remember having this aha moment when I was a junior attending saying, wow, I love, um, I really actually love teaching. And everyone in my family said, well, of course we knew you were going to end up in academic medicine. We knew that you you, you would end up as a teacher. You've always been uh, a, someone who loved teaching. So here I am now. Uh, many years later as a clinician educator. Um, it makes me think about a paper, when I, when I reflect back on those experiences, it makes me think about a paper that the incre an incredible uh, psychiatry resident here now published just in December of 2020, which explores barriers to help seeking among learners in medicine, because I thought, what was the barrier? Is it that I felt that the resources were not there or did I feel that admitting that I needed to seek resources was a problem um, or many other things? And one of the things that Dr. Sturgiopoulos found in this paper published in JAMA Internal Medicine just a few months ago was that learners encounter mixed messages in their training, pro in their training. Programs claim to value their well-being, yet promote institutional policies and norms that reward self-sacrifice and increase productivity. Too often, help seeking and time off are perceived as signs of weakness or poor work ethic. Indeed, trainees report the most substantial barrier to their well being is the lack of time or flexibility to attend to their physical and mental health needs. And, and this paper specifically um, looks at uh, barriers around seeking help around mental, mental health and so mental wellness specifically. But I think when I thought about that, it applied broadly to what my experience had been. So that mixed message, the feeling that to actually acknowledge that you needed to have time to spend with family to support a loved one because you were feeling overwhelmed um, would be an acknowledgement of, um, of weakness, of vulnerability, would be stigmatizing in some way. I already felt that I was on the edge on the liminal places within medicine had that outsider, insider, outsider feeling already. So I think coming forward for me um, was one of the major barriers because of this culture of medicine. And so my, my um, life's work, I realized what has driven a lot of what I do around creating inclusive spaces actually emerged from my own learnings and my own experience. And I rarely speak about it, but I thought that when I'm speaking about mentorship, I had to. The barriers that Dr. Sturgiopoulos talks about in that paper actually are heightened for those from underrepresented groups. And they're heightened due to something called stereotype threat, which is the fact that individual performance um, for those from, under, from historically underrepresented groups in medicine are watched more closely and they're judged more harshly. And this is well known. It's documented in many studies and many interviews that have been done with uh, black and indigenous and other learners. Um, furthermore, in addition to having their behavior, their performance scrutinized more closely, they are concerned that they're likely to be judged as a member of the group that they're from. So rather than representing uh, me as an individual, representing all indigenous peoples. And so what that can lead to actually in what's been articulated as stereotype threat is a concern about actually taking risks because one does not want to um, uh, affect or smear a whole group of people if, for example, you fail. And in fact, a recent study of um, Harvard medical student grads, they looked at three graduating classes 15 years after graduating, and they actually showed how those from underrepresented groups in medicine, as they call them, URIM, were less satisfied with their career um, more than 15 years out. And they also did describe this experience of stereotype threat. So I'm going to move on now to the idea of why those who are underrepresented in medicine need men mentorship. I think I've given a bit of a compelling case with my own story, but I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the other data that we have. If we look, for example, if we go to one of the really important textbooks that I often turn to for Indigenous learners, which is about the public school system, so going right back to kids when they're in elementary school, it, we, it, there are reports that acts of racism, prejudice, and discrimination against them as individuals at that young age 
and collectively as a people. So the individual effects and the collective effects have extremely negative impacts on, the sense of, on their sense of cultural identity. Um, students face experience stress because they often face racism, sometimes on a daily basis. And this actually has resulted in a, in a, in a loss in interest in school for some of them. So starting at that early age, our impact for those who are from structurally marginalized groups around being excluded from education systems. A study of undergraduate students um, uh, done in Edmonton by Curry et al in 2012 actually talks about this idea of racial battle fatigue. It examined the experiences of racism among Indigenous university students and found that they demonstrated what is called racial battle fatigue, which is the depletion of mental and physical resources due to the constant manage engagement of stress response systems to cope with ongoing discrimination. So that experience racial battle fatigue is that experience of being in that current constant state of stress um, and elevation due to the um, recurrent microaggressions or macroaggressions or racist behaviors that those students experienced. And if we look at academic scientists, clinicians and scientists, some of the cultural, social, psychological factors that um, can affect their engagement or persistence of emerging scientists um, for, for people from underrepresented groups include feeling invisible, undervalued, incompetent, discriminated against, isolated and marginalized. When we look at medicine specifically, my colleague and good friend, Dr. Marsha Anderson, and if you look at, at the paper, she was uh, at that point, Dr. Marsha Anderson Dakota, so it's under Dakota, published in 2017. Um, her paper, which in where she interviewed Indigenous learners um, in medical school, they described their experiences of, quote, otherness. They spoke about the challenges of studying medicine, which we all had as medical learners. They talked about the amazing learning opportunities available to them. They've talked about the importance of strength and resilience, but the universal experience that they all described and highlighted was that of racism within the medical school learning environment. And unfortunately, um, these findings have been reported, have been uh, found yet again in recent studies that were done by um, medical students from the Indigenous Physicians Association, where they actually looked at the experiences of last year's students in medical schools across Canada. And these are, they're still reporting experiences of exclusion and racism. When we look at some of the training mistreatment data, we know that verbal harassment was more, was common. Um, and that discrimination based on gender and race was the most relevant for those learners. And that was in a study, an older study from 2014 in learners across the, across the US with um, harassment based on race as high as 19%. We know things like uh, for those who are inducted into the, what's called the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society in the US, which is a high, um, a, a society that honors those who are, um, medical students who graduate with high distinction. Um, we see racial disparities in Black and Asian medical students who are less likely than their white counterparts to be members of that group. Uh, we know that, for example, in the emergency department, there was a study that was published looking at how as women and men trainees go through their training, there's uh, um, their initial uh, EPAs and competencies are deemed as they're judged in a similar way. And then by the time they're uh, three years into their training, there's a significant divergence there with women being graded um, on a in a lower way than men. And one of the things about all of these experiences of mistreatment is that we also know that for those who are experiencing mistreatment in medicine, those learners, they are more likely to have mental health issues, to experience burnout, suicidality, marginalization, and substance use. So this is a major issue I hope I've convinced you that we need to address. Um, 
The issue around the minority tax and burnout is one that I think about all the time and that I want us to, that is, is another um, concern that I have and where mentorship can play a big role. So given all of this, I'm now going to move us into some specific actions and behavior because clearly when we have these uh, levels of um, marginalization, feelings of isolation and feelings of exclusion, we need to actually have deliberate action and proactive behaviors to counteract these factors. Um, and, and one of the really important factors that can help to deal with these experiences is actually evidence-based mentorship. And particularly mentorship that embraces and celebrates the cultural diversity within those mentoring relationships. Mentors play a huge role in facilitating how one a culture, so how one becomes part of the culture of a discipline, and how one develops one's professional identity, one's network. You can imagine how for those from underrepresented groups in medicine, it's that process of acculturation is even more complicated because of cultural societal expectations, bias, social and professional isolation, a lack of self-confidence, numerous other factors. Um, as Denise Weir writes, and I love, I love her work, she, she frequently um, co-authors pieces with one of my good friends, mentors and colleagues, Dr. Arno Kumagai, good intentions must be accompanied by the skills that can, can facilitate dialogue and address conflicts. And the issue is that mentors, having played such a key role in that process of professional identity formation, of acculturation, of um, academic and psychological um, support for learners and, and uh, junior faculty, they can be ill-equipped to address the diverse needs of diverse populations. They may lack formal training and exposure to diverse populations or awareness of their own privilege and their institutions may provide inadequate support. So having said that mentorship is important, that there clearly is a need for mentorship for those who are underrepresented in medicine, what does that look like? What does mentorship for those from, from those underrepresented groups within medicine look like? I'm gonna speak a little bit about the literature and I'm also gonna speak about some of my own feelings about frameworks that must be included in how mentors support um, diverse learners. It must be culturally safe mentorship. It must be trauma-informed and it must be anti-racist. So what is cultural safety? Cultural safety comes from a Maori concept, a Maori idea developed by Dr. Ramsden, who is, an, uh, who is a Maori nurse scientist, to notice that her people, when they went into the hospital system, were having uh, experiencing a different level of care and had experiences of being unsafe. And so she described um, this idea that initially applied in the clinical context and that many of us are now applying in the educational context. So in the clinical context, cultural safety is an outcome. It's defined and experienced by those who receive the service. They feel safe. So when we think about translating that to an educational context, it's defined, cultural safety is defined and experienced by the learner or the mentee. It's uh, not determined by the mentor, although we must support our mentors to learn to be culturally safe. It's based on respectful engagement that can help patients, learners, mentees find their paths to well being. It's based on understanding the power differentials inherent in health service delivery, in healthcare in education, in science education, in institutional discrimination, and the need to fix these inequities. It also requires, and this is very key for mentors, it requires an acknowledgement that we are all bearers of culture, that we all have our own attitudes, beliefs, assumptions, and values. And this is from our IPAC Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada definition of 2009. It requires that we do unconscious bias training. And although unconscious bias training is very important, it may be insufficient we need to go beyond unconscious bias training to thinking about how 
we are all affected by race, ethnicity, ability, gender identity, sexuality, and uh, layer on the social identities there. And how to respond when our learners or mentees have experiences that intersect with that. So cultural safety is critical for mentors. Mentors, particularly those from underrepresented, for, who are mentoring students, learners, um, faculty who are underrepresented in medicine must also be trauma-informed. Trauma-informed means it's again, comes from a clinical practice, but um, my colleague Arno Kumagai wrote about it in the context of, of medical education with a paper called Cutting Close to the Bone. It means that we have to acknowledge the widespread impacts of trauma that we must recognize its signs and symptoms in our clients, in our learners, in those we, in our colleagues, staff, others we work with. Understanding that people who've experienced trauma may creatively deal with it um, through anger, avoidance, substance use, other ways. Recognize that people have different paths to healing from trauma. And we must integrate this idea of trauma-informed care into our practice. Why is it relevant particularly for mentees or others from underrepresented groups in medicine? Because the trauma, when we think about, for example, indigenous peoples is not just about individual trauma that one may experience. It is about the trauma of communities, both historic and ongoing. And there's actually, that's well described by an incredible Lakota psychologist named Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart who applies the concept of trauma to, she describes historical trauma for her people, the Lakota people. And of course, his, historical trauma was not um, a new term for Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart. We've learned about that from um, the Jewish scholars and, and those who've survived the Holocaust. But she looked specifically at how historical trauma affected indigenous people over the course of colonial conquest and attempts at assimilation. So when one is thinking about mentoring an Indigenous learner. One has to, for example, be trauma-informed and think, what is this person's experience with the education system? But not just their individual experience, what is their family member's experience, their community member's experience? Are they a residential school survivor? Are they a 60 scoop survivor? And how might that play out actually in their experiences of being in the medical education system? Thirdly, our mentees must be anti-racist. And anti-racist means our mentors and mentees, sorry. Um, that means that mentors have to start to have that awakening to seeing how stereotypes and biases may be playing out, not only in their own perception of learners with, and mentees with whom they're working, but in how the people they're mentoring are actually being perceived and treated by others. And in addition to recognizing and seeing those, those um, practices and patterns of behavior, they need to actually move from seeing the stereotypes and how they're affecting an individual learner to how they can actually move to support the uh, well, the well-being of their mentee specifically, but also to interrupt the behavior or the policies and practices that are excluding their mentee. I'm gonna give you a specific example actually of a beautiful mentorship program, I think, that was developed by the National, um, it's called the National, the National Institute of Health National Research Mentoring Network. And I come up with those three specific frameworks, which I think are critical aspect of clinical care, education, research, um, for those from structurally marginalized groups. And interestingly, in this amazing program that they developed, which they call culturally aware mentoring, and they support and train mentors around four different theoretical foundations. And what was exciting for me to see is a lot of them align a little bit with some of the ideas that I was talking about. So they created a curriculum based on four theoretical foundations. One is multicultural and feminist theory. And a lot of that, they looked at the work of Patricia Hill Collins and Gloria Ansel Du. And a lot of that is about recognizing who you are and what is your particular situated perspective as a mentor. 
what are you bringing to the engagement with your mentees? What are the biases that you bring? But what are all of your social identities and how they may be playing out? They also built this training session on critical race theory. They um, thirdly incorporated motivation theory and behavioral change, looking at some of the smoking cessation literature, actually. And fourth, fourthly, they felt that um, the literature must, that, that this uh, curriculum must include institutional transformation theory. So with this specific program, and it was to try to diversify the NIH funded scientists, and it's an ongoing program, actually, they ran these sessions to actually equip they created a, a, a curriculum based on some of these ideas, iteratively developed it, trained and studied at least um, 60 plus 66 scientists who had gone through it, who were mentors, and um, then interviewed them afterwards, as well as assess their own perception, um, the, the mentor's own perception of the skills that they had gained. And sure enough, they noted that it was actually a fairly transformative experience for the mentors who had gone through that, and they did feel that they had developed a significant skill set around mentoring people across difference, meaning mentoring people from underrepresented groups, from groups that were different from their own. I'm going to talk now as so a key aspect of mentoring people from underrepresented groups is that mentors must to be skilled up, they must have specific training in this area in some of those areas that I talked about to be culturally safe to be trauma informed to understand their own situated perspective to practice anti racism. By the way, in the culturally aware um, culturally aware mentoring program that the National Institute of Health developed, they actually stated that this was their first um, approach to deal with race and ethnicity specifically, and they felt that after that they would layer on and develop specific programs to look at um, differential at, at dis people with dis mentoring people with disabilities, mentoring people with different um, gender identities. Um, and and other groups who are structurally marginalized. So although it was a focus on on um, teaching about race and racial, ethnic, and cultural issues, it actually is meant to be a much a part of a much bigger um, approach. There are numerous other approaches to skill to teaching mentorships. There's the CARES model, you know, teaching mentors to, to think about competence, autonomy, relatedness, equity, and structure. And again, this is another specific program focused on mentorship across different, so mentoring people for an underrepresented groups. Another really important aspect, though, of supporting people from underrepresented minorities is actually to think innovatively around this. And that is to think about the horizontal mentorship model. And certainly when I look at my own experiences, both um, during my training and also early in my career, that near peer model of mentorship was invaluable. That was where I felt that there was significant support. So clearly one needs skilled mentorship from um, one or two identified member mentors, but the creation of peer networks is another very common idea that emerges in the literature and that's relevant to our practice. Um, it's actually been well, these mentorship, peer mentorship networks or horizontal mentoring has been well studied. Many studies showing that both having the right mentor and developing a supportive network were associated with increased resilience, increased academic productivity, measured by publications and grants. They've been documented to be very helpful for underrepresented students. In one study, deaf students, women, medical faculty, they've all been tied to increased academic um, achievement and professional advancement. So thinking about this idea of creating a network of peers is really important. Peers can both help people gather and think about what are your own professional values, what are your personal values. It can be a chance to gather with people of similar identities who may be experiencing similar struggles. So to normalize the experiences that you're having, the difficulties that you're having, the power struggles that you're seeing, to help actually create networks and social capital. Um, really very, very important for many, many reasons. 
and um, to also counteract those feelings of isolation and marginalization that I described at the beginning when I spoke about my own experience as a learner and as, as a resident physician. Um, it's also shown these peer networks are shown to reduce attrition from academia. So that feeling that I had of wanting to drop out, the feeling of maybe I would never be an academic physician, um, those ideas can be supported by peer mentors. One example, there are many different models for this. And some of the training that is some, there, there are even RCTs looking at different mo models where you have the skilling up of the mentor and also simultaneously have the creation of a peer network uh, or a peer dyad or peer triad where people gather several times a year and it's facilitated and supported. Um, but a good model that I, that you know, resonates with me that I've actually seen um, in practice in, in a varied form, but this one is studied, um, was out of the hospital, Translational Science Institute in New York. And they actually, in this model, um, identify people who've recently graduated from an, an institute, uh, one of their translational sciences institutes, and they identified a handful of people and actually trained them. So again, one of the the, the ideas that we're seeing over and over again is tr mentorship requires skilling up in specific training. So taking those near peers, um, having them engaged in 12 hours of training, um, four sessions of three hours, and then assigning them to groups of, um, of the people who were currently in the um, educational science training program and having them do formal meetings and setting that up and supporting that. And once again, people reported um, great experience with that, both as a, ment as, a, as a mentor. Some of the trials and the RCTs actually show that the enhancement in the experience of the mentee when their mentors have had some of that formal training as well. So just to remind us, we've talked about why it's important for those from structurally marginalized groups to have mentorship. We've talked about how mentors, especially mentoring across difference, must actually have specific skills and must be supported to do that. We've talked about an innovative model, which is the near peer model or horizontal mentorship of yet another aspect of it. And now I'm gonna move on to close this loop for the last few minutes to speak, because uh, I wanna give us lots of time for questions, to speak about my own experience. So we often talk about the circle and coming, coming back and circular models of closure. And I'm gonna speak about culturally relevant and culturally responsive mentorship. And for me, that's come in the forms of having, in the form of having access to working, working with knowledge keepers and elders. And I think that one of the reasons I've been able to do the work that I do, because reconciliation work in healthcare institutions and in educational institutions is not easy. <laughs> there are often moments of, um, of conflict, there are moments of um, intolerance. There are moments of people questioning why you're doing what you're doing. In fact, before we even got on this, on this um, call tonight, I actually said to Samantha, are people going to be able to put anything they want in the chat or are you going to be moderating that? Because I've had so many experiences of problematic comments coming through chats from talks that I do around Indigenous health. But really, the, access, the, the reason I've been able to be sustained in the work that I'm doing now as a clinician, educator, and leader is through my work with the elders. And when I think about the mentorship, the guidance that they provide me, it is not just around attending to um, making strategic decisions for our people, meaning the realm of the mental. It is actually in the realm of the four, direct, the four different directions in which we think about well-being. And I think it's interesting to think about mentorship in this way as well, around physical well-being. What does one need to be physically well to continue to do the work that I do or that you're all doing? And how, as mentors, can we remind learners and our mentees about the importance of looking after yourself, of self-care as an act of radical self-preservation as Audre Lorde says. So supporting 
me thinking about my physical well being and supporting my family, supporting my extended family, community. Um, they teach me, as I've said, about the mental. So I've had numerous conversations in the last few weeks. We're at this point of, of structural change in several of the portfolios that I work with. So really helping me work through some of the strategic decisions that I need to make, but without telling me what to do, but asking questions in the way elders do to make me have the awakening and come into the knowledge on my own. My emotional well-being, reminding me about the importance of relationships. And that, of course, is at the heart of the mentor-mentee relationship, is that it is not just about academic productivity. It is not just about one's psychosocial well-being. It is about being two human beings who are in relation with one another. And lastly, around spiritual well-being. And for me, that is not uh, when I speak about spiritual from an Indigenous Anishinaabe perspective. It is, um, I do not mean religious, although for some people and many in the audience, it may be a specific organized religion, but spirituality and uh, Anishinaabe spirituality is about understanding connectedness, the connectedness of all things, the importance for me of being on the land, the importance of thinking about my ancestors and of the generations to come. So in fact, I started this talk thinking about the gaps and the sadness and the isolation that I had as a learner. And I'm ending this talk thinking about the deep support and mentorship that I feel that enables me to mentor many others. And that is the support that we have from elders and knowledge keepers. And so although I think when we think about mentorship for those from underrepresented groups, clearly you do not need to have a mentor who's from your same background, having either peers of your own background. And if you do for indigenous peoples, having access to the knowledge of elders has been what has really allowed me to feel um, full and fulfilled as a practitioner. So I'm going to stop there. Um, as I've said, the circle is complete and um, open it up for questions. Uh, Jonathan, it's uh, 545, so I hope my timing was okay. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Richardson. Yeah, the timing is spot on. Um, I was really struck um, and moved by the narrative arc, um, the urgency and the, the significance of the problem you've encountered, um, moving through evidence that informs what we should do, but then with this sense of optimism of the support that you are, have received and the support that's starting to build. Um, certainly, I'd welcome people to uh, pose questions to Dr. Richardson. Um, you can do so by coming off mute if you'd prefer to ask a question. If that's um, intimidating or just not um, facilitated in the environment in which you're attending, we'd be happy to have you input your question into the chat. Um, I'm going to start with a question. One of the strategies that I struggled with a little bit thinking about it is how do we check in with our learners um, about their own wellness? I'm just thinking about back to your story. Certainly one of the things that we want to be mindful of is not amplifying or triggering their disconnect or their isolation or their marginalization. Um, could you speak to us about strategies that are effective and safe in that way? Yeah, that's an excellent, that's such a great question, Jonathan. It's interesting because one of the things that when you look at the, um, the skill development of mentors, particularly those who were, who were developing skills to, mem to mentor people from historically marginalized groups, um, one of the pieces in, in the study, for example, of the NIH mentorship network and the, the interviews that were done, people talk actually about the change of not waiting for issues related to racism or discrimination, for example, to come up, but specifically asking about them. So when we start to have this, um, like the, the checklist as a mentor of how are you doing? What are you doing to support your well being? Have you had any experiences of feeling excluded, any experiences of mistreatment? When we start to normalize that and do those regular check ins, I think then it becomes um, destigmatized because it just becomes a known aspect of your you know, encounters and your check ins. 
one of the things that we um, did here when we started our Office of Indigenous Health at the, in, at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Medicine is actually just started to schedule those sort of group peer mentor networks in a way with some with group dinners where we would just let people hang out and meet one another three times a year and then also um, either three times a year or two times a year depending on the schedule of the learner check-ins where it was just a yeah we're just gonna hey how's it going and I think many of our programs now do that certainly um, that our, our site directors do that here the regular check-ins but I think more importantly, when we're talking about those who are who are, ex, you know, feeling excluded, it's that we are training the people who are having those convert who are um, doing those check ins to have the skills to be able to actually um, in, have the informed conversations around. Okay, well, you've experienced mistreatment. What do we What are we going to do about it? Mm. I'm, re I'm really struck with that idea or that concept of normalizing the conversation um, rather than saying, okay we experience distress. And so the, the question almost amplifies the feeling of distress rather than saying this is a normal conversation that we want to check in regularly and make the conversations um, just part of the culture that we have. Um, there's a question from uh, Madeline Verhosek around um, whether you could share with, with us as a group, um, who are the elders you look to as mentors and how that relationship has, has influenced your own role as a physician and as an academic leader? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. So um, I actually, so I've worked with different, different um, uh, elders over the years. Um, and some of them are, are affiliated with my own community. And I won't speak about them. But some of them are actually affiliated with institutions with whom I work or people whom I've actually sought out to become part of our institutional, um, our, our structure so that uh, learners do have access to them. So um, work very closely now with a with a woman named Vanaconda Kennedy Kishbell, who's an Anishinaabe elder, who actually also has a role um, as an as a social as a professor of social work at Laurier University, um, and also work very closely with uh, Diane Longboat, who's a Haudenosaunee elder, who is actually an elder in a senior advisor at um, Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And we also have worked closely with a Métis elder named Senator Constance Simmons, um, and with another Haudenosaunee elder named Cindy White. So have um, groups in different, in different areas and different roles. I, um, I can't, um, I can't emphasize enough how how powerful that um, that they have been for me around being able to have clarity around decision making and and what um, what a gift it is to have access to them and and interestingly the way in which those um, programs are structured is that um, other leaders who are non-indigenous also speak with them so you know uh, we we work closely with. Um, someone when we first set up our office, uh, Kat Krieger, who's a Cayugan elder, and, and he actually just would have office hours. And he was always surprised that the associate dean would come in and speak to him or the, you know, director of assessment would come in and speak to him. So recognizing the, um, the wisdom that's imparted. And, and to me, that's about when we talk about decolonizing space and creating inclusive spaces, just in the same reason I'm not using a PowerPoint slide today to try and be a bit disrupt, uh, slide deck today to try to be a bit disruptive it's about how do we actually recognize that mentorship can take different forms including the incredible wisdom of um, knowledge keepers and elders <clears throat> there's a question from dina hamza um, and if i dina i hope i have the phrasing right here in that relationship between mentor and mentee and the the journey to ensuring that we have an equitable and diverse and inclusive environment. Um, how do you navigate those experiences where you feel um, judged or where inadvertently you pass judgment into that relationship in whichever way the dyad is moving? Um, how do you minimize those situations? How do you recover from them, um, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great, that's a really great question. Um, that's why when I talked about the um, culturally aware mentorship program, that was why they started with 
uh, you know, foundations around feminist theory, um, multicultural learning, um, and anti-racist practice, because one has to, implicit bias training, one actually has to have that level of reflexivity as a mentor and as a mentee. So the reflexivity, meaning not just reflecting on who you are in your practice, reflex, reflexivity means reflecting on power, reflecting on priv your privilege, privileges, your various social identities, your intersecting identities, reflecting on how those may be playing out in the interaction with the person in whom you're with them in, in with whom you're in a mentorship relationship. And I think being able to have transparent and open and honest conversations. So in the same way we're normalizing the, how are you doing? Did you have you had any experiences of mistreatment? We also need to normalize how is this relationship going? We talk about pro focusing on process a lot when we look at indigenous research methodologies. It's not just the outcome. Did my train? Did the person I'm mentoring have uh, academic success? Have other success? It's about the process of the experience of that mentor-mentee relationship. So moving that into um, part of that mentorship checklist, like, is this working or is it not? And if it's not, then maybe I need to speak to someone else. Um, that's where having mentorship teams, another innovative model for underrepresented groups, which I didn't talk about, is playing out at Harvard. They're trying, they're trialing this right now, where, it, and, and I think that was something that resonated resonated very much with me as a junior faculty is who, you know, you have someone who is your uh, clinical mentor who you turn to and you're really stuck. But then there's someone else who's, um, you know, an academic mentor for me in medical education. And then for those who are from, from groups who have been uh, historically excluded, um, someone who has that experience of being in the liminal place or being on the outside, who can help you navigate the power the politics and the strategy. Um, we have uh, two more questions. Uh, first, we'll take a question from uh, Sandra Montero, and then there's one final question in the chat, and then we'll be at our time. Sandra. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Richardson, for sharing your experiences and educating us on how uh, bias can impact the wellness of trainees. Um, so I'll state I'm not a clinician, so I don't supervise medical or health professions trainees, but I do work with graduate students. Um, and when you commented on normalizing the act of asking about trainees wellness and particularly around mistreatment or abuse, um, I'm reminded of some experiences where, you know, if I, if I do approach that with, with a graduate student, there is sometimes an initial sense, um, you know, until they get to know me that maybe I'm setting them up you know, to admit a weakness, uh, and then I'll, I'll get them. Um, it's not explicit, but I, I was sort of, I thought of that as a potential barrier from the trainees side of things. So, you know, with both mentees and mentors coming together to solve this problem, I'm just um, curious if you have any tips, suggestions, or advice uh, for the group. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's always a concern. I think about it often. I'm going to give a clinical example. I'm thinking about how when we go to ask around someone's um, sexual identity or what they do for work or something that seems like a personal question, um, how in particular, if you come, how, how some people will perceive that to be an in, or su substance use, they may perceive that to be quite an invasion. And in particular, if you come from a group where you may be used to being stereotyped around your habits, that's even more of an invasion. So the way I approach that is, again, it's a structured conversation. It's, I'm going to ask you this question. I ask it of all people. And um, this is, you know, this is in the confidence of our relationship. So having like setting the boundaries of the relationship, actually drawing attention to the process, to acknowledging that there's a power differential, acknowledging what your role is as a mentor. I mean, this is where we get into the co like you can't, you know, teachers can't be coaches. 
uh, debate, like if you can't evaluate someone and also coach them. So some of the best practices that you learn, I'm sure from Sharon Strauss around who, you know, who is your mentor. So being really, really specific and intentional. I think the thing about rep mentoring across difference in particular for some of the groups that I've talked about is the intentionality around being clear. What are you here to do? That these are the conversations you're going to have. If they make you uncomfortable, you don't have to have them. But you're trying, this is a part of creating um, a space where they can feel a sense of belonging and feel supported. I can tell you that if someone, if people had asked me about, about some of the things that, was go, that were going on in my life outside of medicine, there's no way I would have told them. But just knowing that there was a care and attention and an understanding because the things that were happening would have been very stigmatized, would have been very stigmatizing. But, you know, the fact that there was an acknowledgement that there's life outside that's creating a major tension or stress, that act alone and being permission, giving, being given permission to actually say, wow, this is, um, this is happening and this is having an impact and you don't have to talk about it is really important. <clears throat> Um, the chat's really starting to fill up with lots of questions, suggesting that uh, we could probably go for a couple more hours, but I know that we have uh, another session scheduled for you in the, the time after six. So I think we have time for one final question. Um, it's a question around how, what advice would you offer to a black or person of color leader who do not have a mentor themselves and are looking for support in their own journey, in their own advancement? That's an amazing question. And, you know, it's interesting because my colleague, um, Sophie Sokoliardis published a great paper after the Me Too movement about mentoring, um, you know, can, can men mentor women? Um, because a lot of men were not wanting to mentor women because they were worried about being called out for, and, you know, something being misinterpreted, et cetera. And they spoke about how that actually is a responsibility. So when you are in a position of power or a position of, um, dominance in a, you know, a white dominated organization. I think um, that is important. So I would say this is where the team mentorship model is important. So turning to people who will become, um, who understand allyship, who understand their situated perspective and how they can help you um, and reaching out to support specifically um, from them within you know, your institution or from another institution, recognizing they may not actually be able to offer the guidance that, you know, a black health leader in a different setting can offer you, but at least they have a knowledge and expertise around the institution and they have um, an understanding and awareness around anti-racist practice and culturally safe practice. That's one thing. So you need someone to support you in that space. But I think you need a team there and you need either the peer network and we have an amazing peer network. I can't even tell you how, in addition to the elders, my network of indigenous women, <laughs> they're all indigenous medical educators supports, we support one another. So you, so that near peer, they, you may even pe have people who are junior to you but are experiencing some of the same experiences. So that's critical. And then I would suggest that you may want to look outside of the specific profession or discipline. So looking to, you know, looking into the art spaces, looking into social sciences and other leaders, because that's a different to, to black leaders or BIPOC leaders there who can actually just speak about how to navigate you know, being in a leadership role in any institution, which is, uh, you know, a white dominant one or uh, not necessarily um, historically inclusive one. So I think looking, I, I see it as very intentional and deliberate, and it's very different than the style of mentorship. I know that the incredible Dr. Sharon Strauss described this morning, um, but I do see that when you are from uh, a, a group that's on you know, has been excluded, there are different needs that are hard to understand. So although you can mentor across difference when you have some of the skills and training that I spoke about, there are times when you just really need to talk to another black man, woman, two, um, queer person who uh, can, can relate. So thank you so much for that. We, we really reached our time. Um, First and foremost, uh, Dr. Richardson, you have challenged us, but you've given some very 
um, applicable and um, thoughtful ways for us to move forward. And also significantly, you haven't killed us by death by PowerPoint. So we're very appreciative of that. Um, thank you to PSI for providing some sponsorship and some funding to make this conference possible. And certainly some thank you to Samantha Applewaite who has been the heart and soul of, of making these two days possible. Um, in the uh, chat, you will see an opportunity for you to provide feedback to us, particularly as we think about planning for 2022. And I realize I got my year wrong, but that's not surprising. Um, and then for those of you interested to join us tomorrow, um, Dr. Sarita Verma will be talking about how we can mentor from a, the lens of an institution. Uh, Dr. Verma is the CEO and Dean of the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Um, you can use the link that you use today to join us. That's starting at 8 a.m. And to everyone, I hope you enjoy your evening and time back into the clinical environment, perhaps away in time with family. And thank you everyone for joining. Okay.